This is Michael Popak, and it's time for Legal AF After Dark. We say the term and words Mar-a-Lago so much, it sounds like a long-lost Humphrey Bogart movie. It's not. It is a trial that's supposed to be happening against Donald Trump. Uh, it's been criminally brought, uh, prosecuted by the special counsel about sticky fingers Trump taking all of our, your and my confidential, classified, national defense information, top secret, secret information, and taking it off with him when he left the White House. That sounds bad and wrong, doesn't it? Sounds like it might have violated some statutes or crimes. It did, including the Espionage Act and obstruction of justice. And there's some new developments in the Florida matter presided over by one Aileen Cannon that we just have to tell you about. Listen to Legal AI. Judge like federal judge Eileen Cannon modeled after lawyers like Alina Haba. When I think about Judge Cannon on the bench, I think about really, and it's unfortunate because Popak, early on, I know you as a member of the Florida bar in addition to New York, um, you know, I think you wanted to keep an, you know, an, an open mind about Judge Eileen Cannon, uh, you know, the way the process works is, you know, she's recommended by the senators there and she did work in the DOJ for a little bit. So, you know, maybe she got it wrong. The first uh, the first round, even though she was a Trump appointee back in 2022, when she did what no ever, no judge ever did in American history by asserting equitable jurisdiction over the search warrant executed at Mar-a-Lago and claimed that Trump should be treated with with, uh, with special rights above everybody else. And she tried to basically stop a search warrant from being validly executed, which was already signed off by a magistrate. And she got reversed twice by the 11th Circuit. So I know everyone was like, oh, right, maybe Judge Eileen Cannon's going to learn from that experience. And as you now know, she has, she's only learned the wrong lessons which is try to do everything possible, but avoid getting reversed from the 11th Circuit. Because the moment the 11th Circuit gets their hands on this, the moment Special Counsel Jack Smith has an ability to appeal an actual order, which he hasn't, and Judge Cannon's been very careful not to let that happen, I think she's going to get thrown off the case. and <laughs> I think she's going to get reversed. Popak, you talked about how that there may even be grounds for removing her right now based on yeah. her failure to file the law and every, or follow the law. And everybody can go back and see the summary you did on last week's Legal AF. And I think you, you broke down the uh, various uh, factors there as well. But let me just break down what she just did. So she previously ordered that the uh, names and identities of uh, confidential witnesses, confidential informants, witness statements, things that never get released. It's, it's unheard of. They don't get released. That, the very reason why you have a protective order in cases is because you keep certain information confidential before there's an actual trial that takes place. Donald Trump has access to the information. The prosecution has access. The judge has access. It's just about not publishing the names of, of potential confidential informants publicly before that, you know, before all of the steps are taken to protect them. If there's a public trial, those names will, will certain to the extent they're going to be testifying, those names will get uh, disclosed. But it's about taking steps and precautions to be protective of witnesses, right? That shouldn't be a novel concept that you have to teach a judge that. That's kind of 101, one of the first things you'll learn about, you know, in kind of a crim law class as you start understanding, you know, protective orders in, in criminal cases. Well, Judge Eileen Cannon made a prior ruling saying she was going to release this public. Basically, she said because Donald Trump wanted to file things that were subject to a protective order on the public docket that she was saying, all right, it's presumptively public now, which is just a ridiculous argument because it would basically render uh, meaningless any protective order. So if there's a protective order, every criminal defendant or every person who wants to violate it would just say, okay, you produced the discovery under the protective order, but aha, tricked ya. I'm gonna I'm gonna make a filing on the public docket and just detach all of your documents to the public docket, and then I've figured out a, a hack. I've hacked the protective order, and I've figured out how to release it, right? I mean, it's just so stupid on its face that it, it doesn't even require, it shouldn't even have to require a judge to be educated. 
But special counsel Jack Smith, when Donald Trump wanted to make this public, said, Judge, we're dealing with witnesses. Of course, you got to protect witnesses. Special counsel Jack Smith didn't have to go on and basically say, actually, uh, Judge Kennan, uh, if you took a law school class, what you should know when you open up the second chapter about witnesses, you need to learn that witnesses need to be protected in criminal cases. It's, it's such a basic concept that it was enough for him to say, obviously, the good, you know, the good cause standard for why you have protective orders is the standard that governs. So she ruled that she was going to make it public. So special counsel Jack Smith said, oh, really, Judge Kenan? What you've done is committed manifest injustice because you're going to get witnesses killed and you applied the wrong legal standard. The standard is a good cause standard. You're requiring us to show a compelling government interest to keep witness identities confidential. But even if we don't show a compelling interest, which we have, by you releasing this information, it's manifest injustice because you're going to get people killed. So Judge Cannon waits and waits and waits and doesn't make rulings because that's what she does. I think she has to think, whoa, I'm going to get reversed by the 11th Circuit and they're going to kick me off this case. So then she has to issue an order this past week where she reversed herself. She, it was like she said, I was wrong, but rather than just admitting that she got it wrong and she applied the wrong standard, which, you know, would be what some judges do. Hey, you know, apologies, I got it wrong. Um, and upon further review and consideration, here's what it actually is a good cause standard. And the court interpreted the, the, the law incorrectly. That, that, that happened. I've seen that happen before where, you know, the courts aren't infallible, but they recognize that they can make a mistake. Frankly, I've never seen it on an issue as basic as this before, but I've seen it on some complicated issues where there may be actual novel issues, not like, okay, we need to protect witnesses. Um, but here is what uh, Judge Cannon ended up uh, saying, if we have the, the order. She goes, the special counsel's initial seal request failed to offer a governing legal framework or any factual support for the relief sought. Instead, it contained only conclusory and unsubstantiated assertions about witness safety, the integrity of the proceedings, and privacy interests. Later, in response to the press coalition's motion, the special counsel failed to engage with let alone refute the press coalition's arguments that the First Amendment attached to these subject materials. And, and she uses this language a lot now I see in her orders, like engage with. She used that before. Remember a few weeks back where she wanted special counsel to engage with other unlawful scenarios? I've never seen a judge refer to engage with it, like just play games. It was a Rubik's Cube. Let me engage with this. No, I mean, special counsel Jack Smith's going to engage with the law. And you as a judge are presumed to like, you should know law 101. So she reversed herself, but then blamed Jack Smith for her error. And again, to me, that shows how unqualified uh, she is. But that also prevents special counsel Jack Smith from appealing that to the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals because Jack Smith won. So it's hard to say, well, I'm going to appeal her blaming me for her mistake when ultimately I won and then she applied the right standard after getting it wrong because I had to educate her and then she blamed me for educating her. One other thing about educating her, back in November, special counsel Jack Smith tried to educate her on actually a fairly complex issue if you don't know SEPA law. If you know SEPA law, the Classified Information Procedure Act, it's very basic about when you set SEPA Section 4 and SEPA Section 5 hearings. So when Judge Cannon set a revised scheduling order, but did not set a SEPA Section 5 hearing, which is when the criminal defendant discloses information that they want to uh, make public that's classified information at the time of, of trial. You're supposed to set a SEPA Section 5 hearing in a scheduling order. It's one of the earlier things that take place in SEPA cases. So Jack Smith said back in you know October or November, hey, judge, you revised your scheduling order, but you have no SEPA Section 5 hearing listed. Can you list it? And then she responds on her minute order, no. My scheduling order is my scheduling order. I'm not doing it. And again, it's a paperless order. That's something that's not appealable because she's within her discretion to set her calendar. And then at the end of this past week, she sets finally the SEPA Section 5 notice for May 9th. So why would, if you were going to set it in May 9th, why wouldn't you just set it 
when special counsel Jack Smith said to do it in October or November. And here's the thing also, Popak, and then let me throw it to you. Mm -hmm. Sure. She hasn't moved the trial date yet. Trial still scheduled for May 20th, 2024. Back on March 1st, there was a hearing on the trial date where special counsel Jack Smith suggested July, Donald Trump suggested never, and she was more on the fence of never than July. She said July is unrealistic, but she has not ruled from March 1 to the recording of this live to April 13th on what the trial date is. And now she's first set a SEPA Section 5 notice May 9th, 11 days before the trial, and she's almost forcing the parties to do the trial prep even though we know that the trial's not going to happen on May 20th. And so I just want people to know when I'm partially critical of Judge Cannon, it's not just an arbitrary, oh, she was appointed by Donald Trump. There are a lot of judges who were appointed by Trump, though, who still follow the law, more that I unfortunately don't. But it's because she doesn't follow the rules. She doesn't follow the law. And she, because she's incompetent, she also doesn't have, though, an intellectual curiosity to get it right. And a good judge may come in young and inexperienced, but want to get it right and learn. And all she wants to do is basically rip apart the law. So I, it, was, it was a long, you, you know, I geek out on SEPA. Sure. I'll let you talk more about the Trump media stock and his false yeah. and misleading statements. But anyway, well, that, that, let that, me that, contribute. That, that was, let me contribute on this segment and, and just a, more of a briefer. She also heard, and as I joked on our legal layoff text chain, what could go wrong with this? She also heard two and a half hours of argument yesterday on motions to dismiss the indictment brought by Carlos de Oliveira, the maintenance worker. I always feel like I'm, I'm talking about a game of Clue, the maintenance worker and the butler in the in the library with a candlestick. Uh, so you got you know Walt Nauta, the butler. Uh, who brings his own motion to dismiss the indictment, and Carlos de Oliveira. And to your point, Ben, why are we in the middle of April talking about a year and a half old indictment and the hearing on the motion to dismiss is just happening now for the indictment, meaning any appeal that either the losing side takes is inevitably going to delay this trial. So we have that going on. You know, Judge Chutkin, by contrast, who's waiting patiently with bated breath to, t to restart her DC election interference case to show you the comparator of somebody who is knowledgeable, seasoned veteran, and knows how to run a courtroom, Judge C. Judge Chutkin. She did the motion practice. You and I reported on the motion practice in the DC election interference case six or eight months ago. And that one, that one came second. So that is just showing you how a judge, through her own fill in the blank, incompetence, lackadaisicalness, lack of lack of effort, willingness to help the other side out, makes decisions, micro decisions that impact the ultimate case. You know, I was thinking, I'm always kind of as you are getting ready for these podcasts and for our audience. I had to remind myself because I knew a lot about Judge Cannon before she got on the bench. She uh, we're not the same age range, but we have people in common. She went to she went to private school down in Coral Gables or Coconut Grove, Florida, sort of where my practice was located. I know people that went to that same school. She went to Duke, my alma mater, for law. She went for undergraduate. She went to Michigan for mit and was high up in her class, magna cum laude, order the coif, the whole thing. Uh, Federalist Society, sure, but you know, there's no reason to believe she was going to be doing the things she's doing now. The reason I bring it up is I got a buddy of mine who's down at Duke for an alumni event, and he took a picture from me and sent it to me of the law school, and it reminded me that Duke Law School has this amazing judicial uh, college for judges. Uh, for, it's basically after you're a judge, you go back to schools like Duke and law school there, and you take additional courses on how to be a better judge. It's like boot camp for judges. Or after it's really it's, it's really a master's program for judges, and I'm thinking, God, I have a perfect candidate for that. And her name, <laughs> I'm wearing my Miami shirt today, and her name is Aileen Cannon. Um, and and her constant, you say this engagement is a weird verbal tick of hers that she writes out. The other thing that's weird for her is that she constantly admits in her orders that she doesn't understand the law. 
Um, and then, as you said, backhandedly criticizes the government. Why did you bring the basic law in this area to my attention earlier? Why don't you know the basic law in this area? Why are you admitting to the world in the last two orders that you've granted that you don't understand the law? that you're using jury instruction uh, hypotheticals to sort of understand the fundamentals of Espionage Act versus Presidential Record Act, which is like for you on this case, you're nine months or a year into the case. How do you not, how have you been making decisions to date? Like what have you been using as your guiding light if you don't understand the law? This is why she's basically admitting inadvertently or otherwise to her appellate bosses at the 11th Circuit that she is unwilling or incompetent to handle the case, which is why as soon as there's another order, and I think there's already been enough of them, he's going to, we'll see this 11th Circuit um, appeal taken uh, at some point. And I think an emotion by, by um, Jack Smith to also have her reassigned off the case while there's still time left on the clock. It's not like a new judge is going to make things go slower. I mean, she doesn't even, like you said, she doesn't even set a trial date, but just to manage expectations. There's no way that trial happens in May, July, or anytime soon. This is not going to be a 2024 pre election event that you and I are going to be able to comment on. I just don't ever see that happening. And we'll have to see what she does on the indictments. Now, the reporting from inside the room on Oliveira, Oliveira and um, Nauda is that she wasn't buying what, what their lawyers were selling. And that I would, sort of be surprised, although she shocked me numerous times before, uh, if she ruled to dismiss any aspect of the indictments against those two, the people that helped Donald Trump with the obstruction of justice counts, not really the Espionage Act, but the obstruction of justice counts in their conduct and their behavior. And so we'll have to, we'll have to see all of that. But I think this is yet another example in this most recent order you talked about, where she's confessed to the world. It's almost like a Freudian slip that she doesn't understand the law, that she has been charged as the lawgiver with understanding. And that has gotten us where we are today, which is we can't report on a trial that should have been set because she hasn't set one. And it's the most basic aspect yeah. of law. I, I would be one thing if, there, if it actually was the kind of uh, nuances of the interplay between SEPA 4, SEPA 5, SEPA 6, SEPA 7, how, the, how that tapestry of uh, classified information procedure statutes play out. If it was your first SEPA trial, I, I, I get that. But on the issue of protecting witnesses, and you're upset that the government didn't play another mind game of enga engaging with ridiculous concepts and you don't understand that witnesses need to be protected i mean i mean it's it's really embarrassing and frankly you know it's embarrassing to the 11th circuit like it's embarrassing to other federal judges in the southern district of florida it rubs off on them that yeah. they have a colleague you know, it would be like uh, if someone was on your team, think about your favorite baseball, basketball, soccer, hockey, whatever team, and there was someone on your team who didn't know how to play the sport, yet they were wearing the jersey and they were, you know, you know, it was a soccer match and then they started picking up the ball with their hands and throwing it into the goal. And it's like, okay, that's not the way you play the sport. It's that embarrassing and humiliating to and, our and colleagues. You, and you've watched me defend the Southern District of Florida because not only do I practice there, but I know many of the judges there from when they were at lawyers yeah. or when they were in, I played softball with them in charity softball tournaments or when they were uh, state court judges. And I have always been proud to have been a member of the Southern District of Florida and many of the lawyers there and the judges there and and the types of cases that they handle and the way they do it. I can't continue to defend, obviously, what's going on in the Fort Pierce division. And it does, as yep. you said, it does back up on the uh, luster of the, of the entire uh, bench. And Judge Altanaga, Chief Judge, do something, although she can't really at this moment do anything. Welcome back. All right, listen. We do our best not to blow smoke or sunshine, even if we're talking about the Sunshine State. Uh, I practice down in Florida. Uh, I haven't appeared before Judge Cannon. I have appeared before many of her colleagues in the Southern District of Florida. Holds a special place near and dear in my heart. I like to report these things, especially with Ben Mycellus. Uh, and we do it right there, just like you saw 
We do it twice a week, Wednesdays and Saturdays at 8 p.m. Eastern time on this YouTube channel. You do that. Don't change the dial. Free subscribe to the Midas Touch YouTube. And then join Legal AF. We have a new Patreon for the cost of, I don't know, in New York, one cup of coffee a month. You'll get exclusive content, sort of like this, but a more deeper drilled down molecular level analysis of the law, but made for non-lawyers. That's what we like to do. Even lawyers seem to enjoy our show, which we really appreciate. So until my next hot take, until my next Legal AF, until my next Patreon exclusive content, this is Michael Popak reporting. Heary, heary, Legal AF Law Breakdown is now in session. Go beyond the headlines and get a deep dive into the important legal concepts you need to know and we discuss every day on Legal AF. Exclusive content you won't find anywhere else, all for the price of a couple of cups of coffee. Join us at patreon.com slash legal AF. That's patreon.com slash legal AF.